It's Christmas Day, the year 2000. I'm with my favorite person in the world, my father. He's taken me to that old store that was once known as Debenhams. And he's taken me to get my early Christmas gift, a dictionary. Now, if you're wondering a dictionary, I grew up in a Caribbean home. Education is key. So the first thing they want to do is to get that message in any single way that they can. As a kid, there's only two things you care to do on Christmas Day. Eat myself into a food coma and also open presents. I used to love opening my Lego because I was always building something for myself. I woke up in the early hours of the morning on Christmas Day. My dad was having a heart attack. My mum performed CPR. Next thing, all I remember was that the paramedics came and they took him out. There was a knock on the door. Two policemen came and they gave me the news. I walked upstairs, told my mother, and I could see the pain etched in her eyes. He had died. On the way to the hospital now, and I'm being held in my mother's arms. And I'll never forget, I held his hand and I said, Mom, is Daddy coming back? She said, no, he's gone to heaven. And I'll never forget that. I called it the cold hand of injustice because my father was ripped from my life. He had no choice. He was the man that adored me, spoiled me, and cherished me. And everybody spoke about how good he was as a father. But I just carried on. Life went on as normal. My mother went through around six months of severe depression, leaving her keys in the door, shoes on top of the car, and having panic attacks. And I'll never forget, when we were driving back from somewhere, she had a panic attack so bad that the police helped to drive us home. My mother informed me that if it was not for me, she would have ended her life. My mum came in the time when it was no blacks, no dogs, and no Irish, and she raised a single son in that time, coming from a country, Trinidad and Tobago, having to navigate the world. I couldn't have imagined how hard that would have been. But most importantly, she persevered and carried on. That very dictionary that my father bought for me became a metaphor for something deeper in my life. It became something that made me realize I need to understand the world. I would study that dictionary. I would sit down and read it and understood all the different words that came out of it. And now I'm here today. So I've entitled this talk, The Straight Jacket of Masculinity, for reasons you're going to see as we go on later. Now I have to give a really big shout out because on the far left is my mother and on the lady with the gray hair is my auntie Lorraine and the lady that looks like she's stifled under my armpit and it was a hot day that was my auntie Mel. And also the lady on the right was my auntie Mackie. These ladies promised to take care of me when my father died. And they kept their promise and they kept their word. So I'm really thankful I was able to be raised with a village of very strong and powerful women who taught me so much about myself, my existence, and most importantly, were great role models in my life. Now, there's a study by psychologist Judith, Judith Stilton, and she says that boys and girls receive different messages about grief from when they're young. And, but she believes boys receive very different messages, four of those messages, about what it means to be a man and what masculinity means. Now, the very first one is the stiff upper lip syndrome, that we must be strong and stoical in the face of difficulty, regardless if we feel fear or pain, we must not complain. And I've been guilty of all of these. Number two, a man must be in control, self-reliant and able to handle any situation without asking for help. And that's that powerful loner stereotype. Number three, a man must protect and keep safe those who are important to him and never trouble them with any of his troubles or concerns. Does that sound familiar to a lot of the men here in this room? A man must overcome any challenge without fear. What's interesting is I'm deeply an introvert. It might not come across that way, but as I stand here on this stage, anxiety sits in my stomach. But there's a great saying that I always run with, 
my level of courage will always outweigh my level of fear. And that's how I've tried to live my life as best as I can. Now, some statistics quite simply show that men are far more likely to go missing, to be rough sleepers, and to depend on alcohol and drugs just because they want to get away from what's happening in their life or the things that they're going through they will not speak about. And what is a crazy statistic is in 2017, out of 6,000 suicides in the UK, 75% of those were men. Suicide is the single biggest killer of men under the age of 45 in the UK. And suicide in the UK is also three times more common amongst men than it is women. Since 1981, the suicide rates for women have halved, whereas for men, it's only gone down by 20%. Men do not speak enough about their issues and we don't speak enough about our problems. Now, the picture on the left, I was asked by a photographer to think about my father and obviously tears come to my eyes whenever I think about him. And on the right is another picture I took for another shoot. There's a contrast for a deliberate reason to show that there's always two sides to most men, but people forget that. The need to be strong, to not show anyone what you're going through. We only typically see one side when at home, a lot of men are suffering. Now, The Lion King is a great movie because very similar to my story, I felt like Simba had his father ripped away from him and he had no choice. He had to understand the world and figure things out all for himself. In regards to the cards that are also on that, I couldn't deal with the cards that I had been dealt, but I had to do something very differently with it. I could, cho I could choose to either be angry at the world and upset, or I could choose to overcome and not just be a victim. Now, therapy for myself, awoke a sleeping giant or trauma within me. I either came from therapy, feeling exhausted from crying, or feeling super happy from getting my emotions out. I had never worked my emotions truthfully, because I never came from an environment that encouraged it, but that wasn't their fault. They came in a time where they just had to work and get on with things. And if it wasn't for my mum and all the other generations before me, we wouldn't have that blueprint and that foundation that we have today to be able to explore our emotions. And there's a great saying that my cousin once told me, that as children, we wear the sins of our parents. So even if I wanted to be angry, and I was a very angry young man at once in my life, I can't do anything about it. That's who I am, but I can change where I'm going. And that's what I decided to do. Now, the photo on the left is when I first started modeling. As you can see, I looked probably emaciated, looked like I didn't get any meals in me at all. But I was being encouraged, positive validation, affirmations. The shoots I was going to, I was always being told that I looked great. Um, I had interest from agencies out in New York. I had interest from agencies all over the world. But I was unhealthy, I was exhausted. I wanted to sleep all the time. I would skip meals all the time just to maintain cheekbones and just so I could look good and to be a hanger. But that was, I can't begin to tell you how toxic that was. I'd come home and I'd sleep and I'd restart the process again. And I did it all for moments like that in the middle for a snapshot in time, a video, a photo, whatever it might be. And now I'm really thankful I can look back at that to see how far that I've come. But the industry was no good for me at a time when I was still discovering who I was as a young man, or a young boy, one might say. I still had abs though, so you know, I'll take that. You know, do you know what I mean? Top two. Now, there's a great saying by Anne Frank that says, dead people receive more flowers because regret is greater than gratitude. And my podcast that I run is all about giving people their flowers in real life and giving them credit for what they have done. And I found out that my dad's dad, so my granddad was actually half Venez was fully, was a Venezuelan immigrant. So I realized where my name came from, Flowers. So I wanna take this time to say a really big shout out to a friend that has transformed my life. 
and I don't say it enough, but in, in my darkest times, um, you've really been there for me a lot, Malcolm. And I'm really thankful for all the things that you have taught me, not only as a best friend, but you've been a father figure to me in so many different ways, from us doing cooking together, from you teaching me how to be a man. And you show me there's another side to me that I hated to accept. You constantly reminded me that it's okay to be emotional, that it's okay to be fearless in who I am as a person. And I don't say it all enough, but from the moment we met at Police Cadets, you transformed my life. And when I was suicidal and you were there, you were unflinching and you were unsupport, you were, you were unflinching, you were unquestioning your support and your love for me. It reminded me just how powerful it was to have a friend like that around. And I believe everybody in the world deserves a friend like you. So I wanna say stand up and take your flowers as I give them to you. Thank you. Now, as I said, growing up without a father, I was always searching for a father figure everywhere in the world. And I was lucky enough to have it in a friend. As I said, we cooked, we've done so many different things together. We've had experiences that I've cherished. We've had dark times, we've had great times, but he showed me what it means to be a wholesome man. He would play R&B music and it's always about love. I got sick and tired of it. But now give me a little bit of soul music, a little bit of jazz, a little bit of R&B. And I'm thankful, as I said, for the experiences you have taught me. So I've got to say a huge thank you. Now, there's something that elephants and, elephants and humans have in common. When there's no male elephants in a herd, the younger male elephants act out because they have no one to show them how to behave in the world. And that's quite interesting for a lot of young boys. We seek external validation through money, women, cars, fame, and even achievements. Because when you think about it, a man is born with no intrinsic value. He, his value is attributed to his social success and the money that he makes. And when you're always chasing achievements, it's very easy to look out into the world and to feel great. But if you're not dealing with what is within, you will not go any further. And I have called it the elephant in the room. And there's a great African proverb that I think greatly epitomizes this. Those who shy away from addressing the elephant in the room are doomed to carry the weight of it. And that's what I did. I carried the weight. I chased all the achievements. I've you know, been a special constable. I did policing. I, I've modeled. I've acted. I've done so much but there was still something in my room that I was not dealing with. I want to give a big shout out to some of these organizations that are doing great work with young men. Mentivity, West Side Young Leaders, Dope Black Dads, and Manhood Academy. They're teaching young boys and giving them positive role models to model themselves off. In the media, typically when we see black success and black excellence, it's become a narrative that is saturated with simply and only rappers and musicians. We need more, we need positive outlooks. And there's a great saying from Lauren Hill that says, how are you gonna win when you're not right within? And that's exactly what I think is so important. We have to look in ourselves. Now, that's my dad there. And I could choose to allow his death to be an anchor or a sail the anchor weighing me down or the sail to push me forward. He didn't die so that I died with him. He died and he lives through me. And I think that is so important on my journey to becoming the man that I wanted to be. And there's my mum and my dad. And I think what has been so powerful is they taught me a lot in life. They taught me so much. There's stories, journeys that I could never really imagine. When you run from pain, Pain will always chase you. And I'm a fast runner, but it caught up with me in the end, no matter what I did. But what today is all about is creating tomorrow's solutions. And when I speak about that, I want people to recognize and remember that there's a lot of men who are struggling with the inner standing of oneself. So when you're trying to understand them, it's gonna to be too hard. They're not gonna be able to do it. Take the time, show compassion, 
and understanding and show that you really care. The best conversations to have with a man typically are when that he's having an activity or when he feels ready to speak. So tomorrow's solutions are typically within us men and the communities that we have around us. Thank you so much. Thank you.